Welcome everyone to UCTV's four-part television series entitled Global Warming Change Starts with Learning. This series is co-sponsored by UCSB's Donald Brand School of Environmental Science and Management and the Community Environmental Council. And funding has been provided by the Global Science and Society uh, Global Warming Series uh, here at UCSB. Uh, in other episodes, we've been talking about a number of related topics, including uh, ecological impacts, resource productivity, and the impacts of global warming on water issues. But today, we're going to be talking about public policy, and I'd like to uh, welcome into the studio our guests. Gentlemen, welcome. Thank, Thank you for you being very here. much. Um, by way of introduction, my name is John Clark. I am a board member of the Community Environmental Council, one of the co-sponsors of the group. Um, CEC's work is very much now on global warming, and for folks that want to find out more about it, you can check out our website at cecsb.org. But you two are the main event. Uh, we're really looking forward to this conversation. Uh, perhaps you could just briefly introduce yourselves and, and let us know a little bit of what you do at the Brand School. Who would like to start? <coughs> Thanks, John. Uh, I'm Oren Young. I'm Professor of Environmental Policy and Institutions at the Bren School. I'm a political scientist by original training. I spent most of my career working on uh, issues of environmental management or environmental regimes. And these days, these issues are particularly exciting and important, and partly because they're occurring now on a larger scale than they ever occurred before. It's not just a local issue, but it's up to a global issue. We'll talk about that today. And partly because the human impact on the Earth's uh, ecosystems is now so much more fundamental than it was in earlier times. So the human issues now are front and center. I'm Charlie Colstead. I'm a professor of environmental economics at the Bren School. And it's, it's really uh, delightful to be here. Uh, a typical question people have is uh, when I tell them that is just what is environmental economics? Well, environmental economics is that branch of economics that's concerned with the environment and in particular concerned with the uh, trade-offs when one is confronted with scarce resources and conflicting objectives. Uh, how does one make decisions to provide environmental protection as well as providing for other societal needs. So it's, it's central to many of the environmental debates that we face today, including climate change, which is what I spend most of my time on. Uh, climate change, the economics of climate change involves uh, the impacts mm. of climate change on societies around the world, the cost of doing something about it, how one gets firms to and individuals to actually reduce emissions in an effective way, uh, how adaptation occurs, just the whole gamut of things that involve the intersection of climate change with the economy. Great. Well, this should be a, a wonderful discussion. And, you know, I just want to start looking at it kind of broadly because this is a complicated field. I mean, particularly for most folks, uh, public policy is discussed in broad terms in the media. Specific things are, are thrown out in the public debate. But, but maybe if you could if we could spend a little time just talking about public policy me measures in general as they relate to climate change, what are the kinds of things that people are talking about? What are the things that have been forward and working just in terms of broad terms? So who would want to start that conversation? Well, um, people have, have, have talk, <coughs> talked about it, uh, broadly about what the uh, dangers are to society. Mm -hmm of not doing something about climate change, trying to translate a lot of the physical measures that have been in the news uh, recently into what that means for people and societies. Uh, that's, that's a big area. And a uh, second area is uh, what, the, what the costs and, uh, and distributional consequences are of actually trying to implement some sort of regulations like California is doing sure. to, to reduce emissions. But, but in, in the policy world, there's, there's specific, uh, you know, there's, there's cap and trade systems, there mm -hmm. are, you know, the CARB debates. I mean, there are different types of policy measures, and I'm just wondering if we could talk a little bit about how you classify the types of policy measures people are putting forward out there? Is, is it command control? Is it more market-based? Is it the cap and trade system? What do you, what do you guys see? Let me pick up on that a little bit. The, at the end of the day, the problem is to influence or guide or steer human behavior. Mm -hmm. That's the real crux of the matter of climate change now. We know that in large measure what's happening is anthropogenic, meaning that it's caused by the 
behavior of large numbers of people. So when we look at policy, what can government do? We have to look at the different methods that government has available to it to influence how people behave in various settings. We know that behavior is critical with respect to things like the use of electricity that's generated by um, fossil fuel combustion. We know that travel, transportation is an important thing. And there's a kind of a set, we call these policy instruments. There's mm -hmm. a set of different instruments which governments can use to try to influence that behavior. These are not mutually exclusive. It's not an all or nothing thing, but we often make a distinction between what we call incentive systems. That is to say, where we're trying to uh, influence how people calculate the benefits and the costs of changing their behavior, and that involves things like uh, environmental tax schemes or cap and trade systems that you mentioned, John. But we also have other ways to influence behavior. We can make regulations which are more of the command and control nature. We said you must, uh, we, we're going to require you to use or introduce certain new kinds of technologies. And so much of the debate, if we now acknowledge that climate change is a real problem and won't go away all by itself, or that the market by itself can't uh, solve this problem, has to do with the, uh, the, the development of a mix of these policy instruments. Mm -hmm. Actually, if, if you use the, the case of California as a very tangible example, that's exactly what we're facing right now the state is facing this as to how to construct ways of implementing the cap that the, the governor and the legislature have, have put in place. How much flexibility will be put into the regulations that are promulgated for the state. And flexibility is a double-edged sword. Flexibility means that if it's hard for this sector of the economy to reduce emissions, another sector of the economy can do it instead as long as the overall reduction exists. Mm -hmm. But the disadvantage of flexibility is you may want a sector to really improve its technology and really to try hard to reduce its emissions. If you give it flexibility, it may find a, a way around that. So it's that's the essence of the debate that's being faced in California over the next right. year or two. Well, I, want, I actually want to talk specifically about some California issues and, and some international ones. But before I do, again, I, I think you did a good job of laying out there, there's these incentive-based systems and then there's more command control and want to talk about how those play out because certainly politically things have changed I think perhaps in terms of the stomach uh, or, or relative uh, political interest in either one of those but before we get into that uh, just as just as a framework how, how would you what would you say are the hallmarks of good policy in terms of climate change I mean how would you know it if you saw it well that worked that didn't what, what are the elements of the balances in those so that as we're talking about policy things later on we can kind of go back to you know this hits the mm -hmm. good button or this is you know or what they tried was kind of in the bad mm -hmm. category so uh, how would you categorize those a couple of remarks on that but, but first I would just pick up on something from the end of the last comments we need to make a distinction between overall goals and the policy instruments we Absolutely. use to achieve these goals. And this leads into your next question, John, because the overall goals are likely to be defined in terms of what concentrations of greenhouse gases in the Earth's atmosphere are acceptable. We have, for example, the general goal of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, which says we should control emissions in a fashion that avoids dangerous anthropogenic interference in the Earth's climate system. And we've spent a lot of time since 1992 when that uh, goal was articulated, figuring out well, what would be a level that would cause dangerous uh, uh, interference in the Earth's climate system. We are now at roughly uh, 375 uh, parts per million by volume of carbon uh, in the Earth's atmosphere. Is 450 acceptable? Is twice pre-industrial levels acceptable? Is six or 700 acceptable? Uh, groups like the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change spend a lot of time trying to figure that out. So that means it's hard to judge um, mm -hmm. whether we're making progress. The good news, on the other hand, is that if we can reach some kind of consensus on what would be an acceptable level, then it's relatively easy to measure success. We can say, are we slowing down? I mean, right now, the uh, concentration of greenhouse gases in the Earth's atmosphere is, is increasing at approximately two parts per million per year. 
And so if we had a policy with certain kinds of interest, we could say, well, let's measure, is, are we reducing the rate of increase of carbon dioxide or other greenhouse gases in the US atmosphere? So the, so the ultimate goal is hard to define, but mm. to measure whether we're moving in a desired direction is not so hard. That's a good answer. I, th I think that's that's a that's a very important thing to separate the goals from the from the ways of implementing the goals. So it's very good points. Uh, to add something to your original question about what characteristics would I look for in a successful policy, um, it would it would have to, a fundamental characteristic would they would have to be addressing one of the goals that I had. It would actually have to be making some environmental progress. That's one thing, not just be window dressing. Uh, a, a second thing would that it would it, it would have to uh, end up being broadly embraced by not only the beneficiaries but the ones being regulated as an effective way of regulating them. And a third way, a uh, third characteristic that I look for is that it wasn't introducing unnecessary. Uh, costs and other burdens that really had no gain from an environmental point of view and uh, some regulations have those some don't mm -hmm. well that's a great framing and actually I wanted to dive into specifics but you've raised some issues here that maybe continue to talk about on the on the on the large level uh, you know there is still uncertainty at play I mean you talk to the scientists we've talked some more on, on the show there's some things that scientists are very certain about and, and some things that they're not particularly in terms of some of those larger goal setting issues. How do you set public policy in, in the face of this wide range of uncertainty uh, and, and uncertainty uh, varies among different people. Obviously some people are, you know, their uncertainty ranges here and other people it's really far out here. So how do you deal with that, that, that range? Yeah. Well, first let me say that uh, uncertainty is characteristic of all public policy decisions. So it's not um, useful to say that this is a different kind of decision than others because of uncertainty. But that said, uh, how do we deal with uncertainty? It's interesting that the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which as many people know has just released the first part of its most recent um, assessment report, has now uh, introduced the notion of trying to assign probabilities to uncertainty. Mm -hmm. Can we say that something is 90% certain, 80% certain, 50% Certain. That's an interesting initiative, I think. And Charlie, you may have some thoughts as to whether that kind of quantification is a step forward or just uh, kind of covering up uh, uh, real uncertainty. But one last point I want to make is that there's a very important distinction in this whole field between uh, climate change, which is slow, gradual, may take place over the next century or two or five. Um, in, in, with respect to which the uncertainty is actually very low. There is not a lot of uncertainty about that. But the other issue is that we know that there, from the Earth's history that there are possibilities of abrupt changes, that is changes in years rather than centuries. And there I think the uncertainty is quite a lot larger and, and the question that arises from the point of view of policymakers, to what extent should we direct our policy toward the slow, long-term but more certain kinds of consequences and to what extent should we take seriously the short, abrupt, but possibly quite uh, disruptive mm -hmm. consequences. And that I think is a hard judgment for a policymaker to make. That, that latter gets almost to sort of the insurance policy kind of policy setting really in terms of... Well, uh, it literally you know, does it, because uh, major insurance companies are facing this problem right now as we have uh, the growing annual cost of destruction associated with, associated with extreme events, which are probably climate related. So you have Munich Re and Swiss Re, the mm -hmm. big insurance companies starting to say, well, wait a minute, maybe we need to rethink the kinds of insurance policies or the fees that we charge for our insurance policies. And, and this is certain degree hits your field quite a bit. I would imagine that sort of uh, the time value of uncertainty really largely, in, in, at least in the business sector, falls down into the economics of it. And, and are you seeing that happen in the policy arena here for climate change where the, that, that uncertainty, the level of probability and also sort of this time uncertainty is being filtered into the political process or is that not part of the equation? Well, we, we tend to, uh, I, I would underscore what Oren says, we tend to, to dwell on the uncertainty in climate change and I, and I think somewhat inappropriately. There certainly are uncertainties, but if you go through just about any public policy decision, environmental or otherwise, 
If you just think of the kinds of things governments are deciding about, groundwater protection, waging wars overseas, there's a great deal of uncertainty, and we, we did, that's just a fact of life. And right now, the problems are tur are tur in climate change are turning away from being stymied by uncertainty to actually deciding what we should do about it. And in that, there are things that the private sector does through insurance companies or through unilateral action, and then there are things that governments can do. And, and what, why is that in this field, uh, that uncertainty has been thrown into the debate in ways that it doesn't seem like it's thrown into other issues? You both have said that. Uncertainty is public, part of the public policy arena, but uncertainty has become a large part of the debate. It's, it's a fascinating question. Hey, let me draw the following contrast in terms of attitudes toward uncertainty. If we're worried about national security, national defense, uh, whether or not there are threats from other places of a serious nature is very uncertain. But we have a tendency uh, in the case of national defense to make to what we call a worst case analysis. In other words, we assume that other people are going to do whatever they're capable of doing that will be threatening to us. And we more or less happily expend hundreds of billions of dollars per year to prepare ourselves for things that may never occur. And for example, in the Cold War, much recent historical writing says, you know, the threat from the Soviet Union never was very serious, but we, it was uncertain, so we said, let's uh, prepare ourselves. It's interesting that in the climate case, we tend, or many people tend to take the opposite view. Let's take the best case analysis and assume that uh, the best situation will develop and, and only expand resources when we're kind of forced to by the reduction of uncertainty. Now your question, John, I think is really fascinating. Why is that? Why, why do we have these different attitudes toward uncertainty? I really have no clear answer to that, but some hypotheses might be in order. Uh, in terms of national defense, even when we were spending hundreds of billions of dollars, it didn't really force the average person to do anything very different tomorrow from what he or she was doing today. Whereas dealing seriously with climate change would in fact require some kinds of alterations in people's day-to-day -day lifestyles. And that I think is something that may be much harder, not because the uncertainty is different, but because people, the implications for people's day-to-day -day mm -hmm. lives might be quite different. Mm -hmm. I, I, I agree with Lauren on that. Well, let's, uh, I want to talk about one other sort of meta issue, um, and, and, it, and it relates, I think, to perhaps how this issue is being framed in the policy arena that's different than other issues, and that's the, that's the concept of trade-offs. You read some magazines, and the trade-off between climate change is you can fix climate change or you can feed the poor. Choose. And, and these very interesting dichotomies are being thrown out there. Is, are those reasonable trade-offs? Is this the way the debate should be framed, or are people misframing the debate? How would you guys respond to that? Well, uh, to, I mean, there is, there is an element of that that we only have so many resources and we can't do everything with them. Uh, but the point about climate change, that it's either you, you, you go whole hog and make it the top priority in life or do nothing, that those are the only two choices, is I think the wrong way to look at it. There are certainly a lot of things that can be done about climate change and it need not be the total disruptor of life that some of the detractors make it out to be. We can do a lot more than we're doing now and still have enough money to pursue our other mm -hmm. social objectives. I would also say on that point that um, this is an issue which may be more real and more understandable on the part of other countries in the world, the Indias and the Chinas and so on in comparison with the U.S. I mean, we have poor people in the United States, but quite frankly, it's a matter of social policy rather than capacity to deal with it. Uh, and we are historically, of course, the main source of uh, greenhouse gas emissions. So I can see where if you're India, if you're Bangladesh, you might say, this is a pretty substantial trade-off. If we're going to put a lot of money into climate change, we really are going to have to shortchange other things. But I think it's not a very persuasive argument uh, if you're focusing it around this country. Mm -hmm. I remember Frances Moore Le Pay always used to talk about global hunger, and her case was pretty clear. It's not a matter of food. You know, we've got enough food. It's a matter of will and, and distributing it to people that don't have money. And well, I, I should add that in, in other environmental um, problems like the um, chlorofluorocarbons leading to ozone, the whole, 
the way we structure our international agreements is that we have poor countries bought in to the agreement by the f developed world uh, paying for whatever steps mm -hmm. are needed to take for them to solve the problem. Well, let's start to talk about some sp specific policy, and, and I don't, you know, for whatever reason, I don't think you can really talk about climate change policy without talking about Kyoto, at, at least to get things going. <laughs> so uh, perhaps you could uh, tell folks specifically what was in the treaty, because I think it's generally a, you know, a one-word icon for most people. You know, what are the kinds of things that were in it, and, and what's panning out pretty well, and what doesn't seem to be working, and then we can move into some other issues. It, it was, it's, it's really two things. There's a treaty which is the Framework Convention on Climate Change, which George Bush the Elder is actually the responsible for. Mm -hmm. And it said, basically, this is, we all agree that climate change is a problem. We all agree we'll do something about it um, to avoid dangerous um, man-made interference with the climate. That's basically what it said. And then uh, the Kyoto Protocol came about five years later and it, it had a way of implementing those broad goals. And in fact, the original Kyoto framework was proposed by the Americans. And that, that framework was to have targets for individual developed countries, that they would reduce their emissions by approximately 7% below 1990 levels by the year 2010, you know, a couple years from now. Mm -hmm. It doesn't sound like a lot, but 1990 to 2010, all these countries are merrily expanding their economy, expanding their populations. So all of a sudden, we, we're, we're now 17 years away from 1990, and, and big reductions would be required from different countries to achieve that. And one, one just amplification of that is that, as Charlie says, there are these two agreements. And it's important to be aware that the United States is a signatory and has ratified the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, which, right. as Charlie Obviously. said, is a recognition, an agreement, an acceptance that this is a real problem. So we are, in fact, bound by that convention. What we did not uh, ratify is the protocol, which is focused, as Charlie said, on a particular methodology for cutting mm. back or reducing uh, emissions. But we are, nonetheless, um, obligated under the, under the convention. We should also say that the Kyoto Protocol covers a period lasting until 2012. And all of the provisions of the protocol simply expire in 2012, which is not very far away. Here we are, 2007, no, mm -hmm. especially as in, in public policy time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so and the international community now is focused intensively on the post-Kyoto climate regime. So there is another opportunity and a way for the U.S. to come back into the dialogue, even if we don't change our views on Kyoto as in, such. In fact, I think most debate now is focusing on the post-Kyoto actions, not so much on whether countries would join Kyoto. I mean, some people would like that, but as Orrin points out, we're almost finished with Kyoto. 2012 is just a few years away. So people are really focusing on what's going to happen in the 2015-2020 period. And that's where uh, all countries are sort of on an equal playing field. So, so let me make sure I have this clear in my own mind. So the protocol is sunsetting or the treaty is sunsetting in the, 2012? The protocol. The protocol. The, the, the treaty is indefinite. Great. And so, and so is it safe to say that the, the, sort of the, the relevancy of that specific protocol is diminishing as the years go by? Absolutely, except in symbolic terms. I mean, mm -hmm. It's symbolic that the United States was prominently unwilling to join it. But in terms of solving or significantly addressing the larger problem of climate change, the real focus of concern and attention now is post-Kyoto. Mm -hmm. What kind of an agreement? Will it be more of the same, a sort of targets and timetables agreement? Will it be some other kind of agreement which gets us back toward these uh, policy instrument questions? The one thing I would stress here also is that more and more people are aware that while in the post Kyoto era we need to think very hard still about how do we reduce emissions, how do we mitigate the problem, we also know that the impacts of climate change are now no longer just theoretical mm -hmm. or potential. There are a number of places around the world where the impacts of climate change are real. They're happening now. 
It's our second major dimension of the post-Kyoto uh, debate uh, will be on what people call adaptation. It's, on the one hand, we want to reduce the likelihood of severe climate change. On the other hand, recognizing that climate change is a reality, what can we do in terms of policy that would uh, help to um, minimize or to, uh, to respond to these impacts in ways that would not severely harm human welfare? Well, let's follow that point, in going completely off my agenda, but that's okay, because I think that's really interesting that, you know, in economics, theoretically, you would like the costs and the benefits to be meshing, both in terms of their sort of level, but also the benefiter is paying for the costs, and it seems like, uh, in terms of an externality, this is a huge one, and, and the people being impacted by climate change are not necessarily the people making the money uh, generating the carbon. How, it's just so big and, and, and so international, are there mechanisms to start to capture and, and, and connect some of those costs, or is this beyond what we know how to do? Well, this is a very big challenge, climate change. It's, mm -hmm. it's uh, almost beyond the capability of, of mankind to address because there is this, there's this disconnect in space between the costs and benefits. The U.S., as we know, will we'll have to bear the cost just as if we've benefited from our emissions, we'll have to bear the cost of reducing it. But we're fairly, we're more robust in being able to uh, endure the consequences of mm -hmm. climate change than other countries that are Bangladesh, for instance, which is very close to sea level. Then there's also the temporal disconnect that uh, much of the costs would be borne by current generations, logically, but many of the benefits will, uh, t will take a, a few generations to work out, and it's very difficult for the political system to deal with deal with that intertemporal disconnection. Mm -hmm. So this is a very tough problem. I, I, some of the maps as I, I, that I was seeing on, on the impacts of, of you know, the ocean rising in terms of Bangladesh, 60% would be gone in terms of some scenarios. And that's, you know, that's a cost. Florida too, by the way. <laughs> right, but right. 25% on the usual. Right. But, but, uh, but, but, that, but as a political scientist, John, to reinforce this point, it, it, we, we know that it makes it difficult to deal with public policy when there's a major asymmetry between those people and those groups in society who will bear the costs of a problem mm -hmm. and those groups who are by and large uh, responsible for the cause of the problem. Mm -hmm. that's, a that, that's a characteristic of a policy problem that oh, it always makes it tougher to deal with than situations that don't have that kind mm -hmm. of an asymmetry. And that's whether it's domestically within the country or globally in the world. And do you rely on morals and ethics? I mean, the EU seems to be stepping up very significantly on this issue. Are they stepping up because of their read of the impacts of them, or are they stepping up because it's you know, a moral imperative, or is that just too naive of a question? Um, I mean, I, I, the, with all due respect to the EU, uh, they, they certainly, I think their heart is in the right place, but if you actually look at the uh, emissions growth in the economies of the EU, they look quite similar to the U.S. You only have Germany and the U.K. having significant reductions, in part because of the absorption of Eastern Germany mm -hmm. and North Sea gas. If you look at Italy or Spain, their emissions have expanded more than the U.S. over the last 15 years. But and their that, heart is in the right place, for that sure. That doesn't seem to be reflected in their political dialogue at all. I mean, that, that reality and, and what they... Well, they, they want... The, I mean, the, their political dialogue is more positive than the U.S. in the sense that they want to do something about it. Mm -hmm. It's just that these are, are tough problems, just as Orrin has said. Hmm. Because there are two levels in the EU. There is, Charlie says, the level of the individual country, Germany, Spain, U.K., and so on. And then there's the level of the EU as a whole, and I think it's fair to say that the dialogue in the EU, particularly at the EU as a whole level, has been uh, stronger in terms of dealing with climate change. But then again, they have these sort of special situations that have made it easier for them to meet at least the Kyoto, or to approximate mm -hmm. meeting the Kyoto obligations. But to come back to your point about motivations, and what motivates the EU, are they more ethical or more sensitive to the woes of other people? It's always hard to establish in any uh, firm way motivations, but what really motivates uh, people. I think it's fair to say that the EU policymakers are concerned about the impacts on the rest of the world, but also I think it goes very much to uh, 
there are some visions that they have about lifestyle in the EU and how that mm -hmm. would be affected by uh, major uh, climate changes. So I, I don't think it's an act of altruism <laughs> on mm -hmm. the part of the EU, although I don't deny that they are concerned in some ways about mm -hmm. the rest of the world. Well, um, you know, I, this could clearly be a three-hour show, um, and <laughs> and it's not going to be. And I and I I don't want us to end at all without uh, getting into some specifics. And and I guess the way I want to dive into that is, you know, you're the Uber policy boss for the state, the country, the world, and you get to set policy and have it your way. And and you're smart. And what would each of you do? What's your what's your policy prescription? And and why would you choose? your flanks of policies that you would put forward and, and let's get down and get to specifics and how would you do it and and you know i guess first case you know you don't have to deal with political realities if you want to deal with this on a technical basis okay. well what's going to work and we, then we'll we then we'll lay in, the political realities and then we'll layer afterwards. in reality <laughs> yeah so what would it be to to get the job done what policy policies I mean, would put forward let, let's say i was just the uber policy I, the, I was the arnold of this thing and just we're dealing with california because I think it's, uh, you know, we're the, our economy's more or less the size of France mm -hmm. or Italy. Uh, and we also are doing it. So it's not a hypothetical question. I think that uh, my goal would be to uh, try to reduce emissions in the most cost effective and gradual way. I don't mean stretching it out over a century, but, but doing it over a decade making it clear what steps are going to be taken in advance so that, that, that firms and individuals are not caught unawares, gradually introducing it, having the maximum amount of flexibility. My two goals would be to actually get emissions down and to do it in a way that has the uh, smallest impact on costs and takes care of the people that are in negatively affected by the the actions I'm introducing. If I'm introducing actions that will reduce gasoline consumption, the people in Palmdale are going to be very adversely affected. Their homes are going to de decline in value. I need to take care of them. So those, those are the three things that I would focus on. I guess and from my point of view, <clears throat> leaving aside politics for the moment, and of course the devil is almost always in the Absolutely. politics, which I presume we'll get to. Yeah, I would to also think of a multi-pronged approach. Um, I, th I think there's both the question of incentives, whether this is cap and trade or carbon taxes to reduce consumption, but I also think there are a couple of other prongs. I mean, one is, and I, I tend to think that there's a lot of potential here, is to lower demand um, by, through various kinds of conservation. For energy, measures, you mean? For mm -hmm. energy consumption. And that's all the way from uh, changing the insulation in your house to changing the kind of um, daily round of driving in your car that you may do. It's, in other words, conservation is one mm -hmm. kind of a policy instrument. Um, and then, of course, there's the issue of um, alternative fuels. Um, we know uh, in a fairly long period of time in this country, including the present, there are a variety of at least de facto subsidies that encourage us to use fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. um, so I would be very interested, again, when, when I get into the political details, mm -hmm. <laughs> but in principle, uh, devising policies that would reduce de facto subsidies for, for hydrocarbons and to encourage um, the use of alternative kinds of fuels and alternative technologies, most of which are many of which are perfectly feasible from an engineering point of view. That's not our problem. The problem is to figure out how to get them um, translated into technologies that are in common and widespread use in our society as a whole. So just, just to clarify, just to make sure that I'm clear on these concepts, you've mentioned a couple of things in there. One is cap and trade, and it gets thrown around a lot. But could, could you maybe talk specifically how that works, just in case there are people watching and, and me? that may not be clear upon those details. What are we talking about in a cap and trade system and what are the hallmarks of a good cap and trade system? Well, let's just take the state of California. We, we identify the total amount of emissions that we have now and who they're coming, where they're coming from and we identify how much we want. And let's say that's 80% of where we are now. 
So everybody that's currently emitting gets a permit to emit 80% of that level. And they're going to be scratching their heads. Either they're going to have to reduce their emissions or they're going to have to look around and buy someone else's right so that they don't have to reduce, but that someone else will have to be reducing even more. So we have this trade in the, in the rights to emit. The, the result is that we have the cap will absolutely be met mm -hmm. because we've handed out these rights to emit. It'll be reduced, and the trading in the market will, will equalize the effort among the various individuals. That's a simple way of doing it. Do, do it works I, very well. Do I get my, I'm a polluter right now, so I get my 80% of my level for free, or do I have to well, buy it for know, free? That, and, and how, that's does, where that, the how does that work is. with sort of new folks that yeah, want to so start polluting the, tomorrow? This is where a cap and trade is not, I think this <clears throat> part of why it's difficult for people to understand that cap and trade is not one single precise uniform mechanism. There are a variety of different systems of cap and trade that could be sure. uh, implemented depending upon our analysis of what would do the job best. And the initial allocation of what people often call allowances is one of those things that can be done in various ways. Mm -hmm. One way, as Charlie suggested, is we cut back to 80% and the existing uh, emitters are allowed or given allowances up to 80% of their current emission. But there are other ways. So for example, one could have a lottery or one could have an auction to get people to, uh, <clears throat> by the way, when we get to politics, those will be very critical questions. Any minute now. But <clears throat> there are also questions about if you find that you can't reduce by 20%, or it's too expensive for you to reduce by 20%, but still you have this obligation to get down to 80%, what do you do? Well, there are all kinds of questions about are you allowed to buy offsets? Mm -hmm. for example, can you plant a forest in, in China, or can you... Um, fund an HF, HCFC plant in China and so on. That gets really controversial mm -hmm. as to what, you can, what you're allowed to do to meet your obligations if you can't just cut back on your emissions directly. That, that's a very good point. Uh, to, to address the first point, the bills in Congress now typically have most allowances given away for free in early years and then gradually phased in so that it's maybe 50% free and 50% you have to buy on the market that are auctioned by the government. So, uh, uh, it, 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 anyway, I think that's and this is what clarification. The, this is what the Europeans have done. There's a so-called uh, emissions trading scheme that started in 2005 in Europe. And in the initial allocation of, as they call them, allowances, they basically went to the uh, industrial plants and power plants that were uh, already emitting the greenhouse gases. Hmm. And, and so I'm a big power plant that, you know, is emitting a lot. I could be a big winner out of that Absolutely. scheme. Absolutely. Oh, great. I can shut down, sell these off, you know, retire to the Mediterranean and be very happy. I, 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 unless you bought them. Uh, right. But, well, but if they're given away if, on the front If, if you get row. your initial allocation, mm -hmm. you know, I give you your, you know, happy allowances days. for right. so many thousand tons of carbon emissions. Mm -hmm. And you happen to be in an industry which is technologically very agile and uh, mm -hmm. doesn't have long-term uh, investments that are going to take 30 years to pay off, but you have flexibility. You might say, hmm, this is an opportunity for me. I could actually cut back on my emissions comparatively cheaply if you were in this, mm -hmm. if this very nice situation. I might have some allowances left over. Uh, and I might be able to sell those on the market. But then it depends on what the market price turns out to be. And we know in the European case that the market has been extremely volatile. Charlie, you probably mm. follow this. Well, it has. I mean, the I, price collapsed uh, Collapsed once or twice, you know, going mm. from 30 euros down to 5 euros wow. uh, overnight. Uh, it's vo That's volatile. That, as that would make word. planning difficult, yes. I would think. But they're just starting this experiment. Right. It's only a year or so old. Right. Right. There is a sort of, an, it's, a, it's another kind of uncertainty in a sense. Yeah, right. Absolutely. If you're the CEO and you're thinking to yourself, hmm, let's see, I'm going to have an obligation to do some cutting back. Um, what should I do? You would like to know what the market price, you can think of this almost in terms of uh, like futures. I mean, the, in fact, there even are speculators. There are who, futures mm -hmm. markets. There are futures mm -hmm. markets where you say, well, in 2012 or 11, let me, let me forecast what I think the price of an allowance for a thousand tons will be. If I think it's going to go up, I might buy 
now mm -hmm. in the hope of winning big. Sure. But, but things like other futures markets, uh, you know this better than I do, Charlie, but futures markets are notoriously volatile. Markets. Lots of people have gone Lots broke risk, in the future right. market, yes. Some win big, but, yes, but, but, but some lose big. lose big. So before we talk political reality, and I think that in our last 15 minutes we absolutely want to do that, but the, the other sort of meta scheme was ta using taxes, and, and it doesn't seem like that has caught on in the same way, but it seems like in some ways it could be much simpler and, and more straightforward and not have to deal with a number of these things. So let's talk about some tax schemes involved in this and, and where that might work out. And if you want to lay in political reality and get the, get the conversation started on that, that, that's just fine. So what are the tax possibilities with this? Well, we all know how, how taxes fare in legislatures in the United States. I don't need to tell anybody about that. Uh, what's been proposed is what's called uh, harmonized taxes. So uh, we agree with the EU to tax our own folks at a certain level. Each country keeps the revenue. There's not a transfer across boundaries. That seems mm -hmm. to be the most effective way. Um, for instance, we would agree with the EU that we're going to put a dollar or two on the price of gasoline and do the similar things on other sources of, uh, of sources of greenhouse gases. And the EU would say, okay, we agree to do the same. China, Japan might do the same thing. That's really the, what's been proposed by people as, as a tax approach. And you can talk about the political well, well, issues. This, this is the segue <laughs> okay, into yeah, politics. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Because the, yeah, try to separate tax and politics, the, right? That's right. <laughs> when did that succeed? Right. Yeah. Um, because there, as I understand it, uh, Charlie is more of an expert than I am, but there are a number of respects in which taxes, carbon taxes, are quite attractive in principle as a way of dealing with this, especially if they were um, revenue neutral carbon taxes. But people may be a little unclear about that, but what, what is meant by revenue neutral is you increase the taxes on greenhouse gas emitting activities, whatever those are, but you may reduce taxes somewhere else so that the overall tax burden or tax uh, bill for society as a whole would not go up. This is not just a way of soaking mm -hmm. people. But then we come to Actually, the if we just use an example, put a dollar on the tax at price of gasoline in the state of California and get rid of the sales tax. Mm -hmm. That would be an example of a possible revenue. For, for example, and that's, that I think is one of the things that makes the tax option in some ways quite attractive. It's you're not saying to people, your cost of living across the board is going to rise by however much it costs to save the planet from from climate change, but we're going to increase, we're going to try to guide your incentives by increasing taxes here and maybe lowering them there. But as we know, um, <clears throat> unless it's uh, reducing uh, income taxes on the uh, wealthiest segment of society, which seems to have a certain popularity in the current administration, otherwise uh, taxes are a very hard sell politically. And taxes where the government is in some sense on your back, right? The government is saying you must pay into the common fund some of your hard-earned money. Mm -hmm. And so people tend to be very sensitive about um, anything that has to do with taxes. Remember back to the first Bush administration where you know, the famous slogan in the 1988 election was, read my lips, <laughs> no new taxes. <clears throat> the administration didn't in fact completely live up to that promise, and that was part of why they got beaten in 1992. But taxes seem to be hot button issues when it comes to the politics of these things. So how can we, how could we um, somehow or other introduce taxes in a way that would not uh, instantly trigger the knee jerk, we're against it, don't tell us anything more reaction we often get when taxes are on the table. Well, so, so politics is moving around some of these issues and policy issues are being put, put forward. What are you seeing out there in terms of the political reality and policy? I mean, we could start with California. Things are starting to change here. How, how is that playing out? Well, we're not gonna see a, I don't think we're going to see a tax in California. I wasn't talking about tax. This is just policy measures in general. Yeah, I, th I think it's the cap and, tr cap and trade is, is what we're moving to. Mm -hmm. we, already, we already have a law that regulates automobile emissions, CO2 levels in automobile emissions. It's supposed to go into effect in, I think, tw 2009. Uh, <clears throat> I think it, the regulations have yet to be developed 
they're supposed to be done in the next year or so, but I think we're going to see a cap and trade system in the state over our total CO2. The real question will be how expansive is it? How inclusive is it? Or is it, is it going to be a narrow thing with lots of people outside of it? Or is it going to be expansive? That's mm -hmm. the real issue. Yeah, I, I do see some rays of hope in this context, uh, particularly in the changing political scene. <clears throat> I mean, on the one hand, we now have as the uh, Speaker of the House of Representatives, Nancy Pelosi from California, and she has created a special committee on climate change. It's not a legislating committee, but it may have quite significant policy uh, uh, influence. We also have in the Senate the new uh, chair of the Senate Committee on Environment and Public Works, which is likely to be the most important committee, <clears throat> is Barbara Boxer, also from California, who has already co-sponsored uh, a bill in Congress on climate change in this session calling by 2050 for an 80% reduction. But she replaces a guy from Oklahoma called James Inhofe, who is most famous, most well known in America for saying that the whole issue of climate change is a hoax, mm -hmm. which is being perpetrated by us scientists on the poor uh, people who are being told they have to do something about this. And the other thing I want to say in this regard is that Congressional or legislative behavior is one thing, but legislators are very sensitized to uh, what they perceive as shifts in public opinion. And I do think, I may be over-optimistic here, but I do think that they're beginning to see some shifting of public perceptions and public attitudes, not that the public knows what the right policy instrument is. That's complex in a way. But more generally, just that the public is beginning to say, I think, you know, this is a serious issue. Um, we as a society maybe should start to take this as something that really requires significant uh, response, significant initiative. To the extent that that's true, I think the political system is more likely to start the wheels grind slowly. But to start to take this issue seriously, to get it on the agenda, mm -hmm. to something to be discussed, as a policy issue that could realistically lead to legislation rather than just something you put on the agenda to talk about every year, but it's not going to go anywhere. I, I know, um, actually, in our own hometown here in Santa Barbara, um, a movement has come to the community called the 2030 Challenge. I'm sure you've heard about it, but basically saying 40 to 50 percent of our emissions are related to buildings and how we build and manage them. And our own city council in the city of Santa Barbara got a, uh, a presentation from the Contractors Association and the Community Environmental Council and everyone in between saying, ordinance us. And, and the interesting thing about this one subsection of, of climate change reduction is mm. local government said, we can do this. You know, building ordinances are ours. You know, what people build in this community is in our purview. And so do you see the potential of sort of a thousand fires burning of different communities taking what steps they can to move forward and, and, and then building that political will that you're talking about to address some of the bigger issues like transportation and cash standards and whatnot. I would just say that we can all do that. I mean, we don't even have to have communities do it. We mm -hmm. all can take actions in our life to reduce our uh, emissions, basically, or impacts on emissions. And, and that would also go for communities. And mm -hmm. that can be very effective. But I think it's a fascinating development. And I'm somewhat optimistic about it. I mean, from one point of view, we scientists, social scientists, might say, well, this is a classic situation where we would expect, expect something we call the free rider phenomenon. That is to say, it would be nice to solve this problem, but it would be even nicer if somebody else pays the cost and I benefit from taking care of the climate change problem. But what I think we're beginning to see at the level of mayors, local communities, uh, groups like CEC and so on, is a there's a, a range of initiatives of people starting to say, um, we could do something. We could actually not just uh, cast our vote for president, but we could do something more at the local level. I think that's a fascinating phenomenon, uh, certainly fascinating from the point of view of a political response to a policy issue. How far it will go, we don't know yet, but it's a real sign of hope and optimism, mm -hmm. I believe. I think ma in many cases these local... Uh, movements are happening because there wasn't appeared to be moving on any other level so they they went to where they could which is and, and uh, on a very grassroots see, level and now you see the mayors of lots and lots of 
cities and communities starting to get together and say, let's, let's have a meeting, let's compare notes. What mm -hmm. are you doing? What are we doing? And that starts to build a certain kind of political momentum. So how does it's that not just the isolated, what is Marty Bloom going to do in Santa right. Barbara, but what are we 300 or 500 mayors going to do and how can we coordinate to make Does that translate again? naturally to state and federal policy or do things have to happen in order for that transit transmission to take place? Well, it's very analogous to state p policy. I mean, states it, one of are one of 50. It, it, each state is one of 50, and they're taking unilateral action. Mm -hmm. It's very analogous to a community doing it, and I, th I think we're seeing a lot of that. Mm -hmm. You also believe, speaking now about politics, that at the real secret to success in these things is when bottom-up <coughs> um, energy, when, when bottom-up initiatives meet some kind of political or policy champion from the top or from above. And where you see real changes occurring is where that connection is made, that you get this groundswell from below and some influential, not necessarily the president, but some influential mm -hmm. leaders. In fact, I think you're beginning to see this in California with uh, Governor Schwarzenegger, who may have been in favor of uh, doing things about climate change for a number of years, but I think there's a lot of indication that he is now perceiving this as a potentially winning issue for him, for his legacy and the governorship, and thinking, well, maybe we can really make a connection here between what we're seeing from the mayors and the cities and what he's seeing as an opportunity at the higher level. So do you think other Republicans are, are taking that lesson seriously outside of the state? Well, some are. Good question. Um, you know, uh, for all the other things you may not like about him, John McCain certainly is yeah. taking it seriously. Mm -hmm. That that will be when some of the people who you would not immediately anticipate, knowing what we know about their backgrounds, come out and start to say these things. That will be an indicator. Right. I think that there really is starting to be a potential sea change in the political landscape with respect to these issues. Gentlemen, we're down to our last few minutes, and we're going to ask you for closing comments in a second. But, but one of the things, actually, uh, the guy that brought the 2030 challenge to California in his talk here in Santa Barbara, he said, you know, we're already doing this in New Mexico. No one knows about it. The reason I'm talking to you in California, because if you do it, it gets done. You know, you, you can set the tone for the country. Do you see that as a possibility with this issue? Well, we, we always ha have been leaders in environmental matters in, in California, starting in the early 60s with our regulating automobiles before anybody else did. So I think it's just business as usual for the state. Right. Yeah, I, I would echo that strongly. I think there's no question that California has leadership um, potential and capacity in an issue like this. So our last couple of minutes, any last comments of the audience, uh, thoughts and ideas, suggestions, things people can do on this issue, particularly as it relates to policy? Well, I, I think that, that two things, two points. One, people can do, do things individually and locally without waiting for the federal government to do it. It's not a substitute, but there's a lot we can do. And then secondly, I would, would plead for policy action that at, at least starts moving in the direction of doing something about climate change. It doesn't have to be an enormous step. Small steps are, are much better than no steps at all. Great. I would certainly agree with that. One other comment I would make, and I would hope this would get into the debate, is I think the longer and even not so much longer costs of doing nothing may turn out to be huge. We tend to focus on the cost, how much would it cost us to do something, and is it going to be 1% of GDP or something else? But if you start to think about it comparatively, what are the costs, even with uncertainties, the expected costs in 25 years of not doing something versus the costs of taking reasonable actions now to head off the worst of the problems. I think the uh, doing something now would win great. hands down. Well, thanks. And we're going to end on that. Thank you so much for being here. That was a great discussion. Uh, thank everyone for watching, and we'll see you next time.